The following interview was conducted with Professor Charles H. Holloman, Professor Emeritus of Aviation Technology for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Thursday, June the 18th, 2009 at his residence in West Lafayette. Welcome and good afternoon and thank you. Let's begin by telling us where and when you were born and your parents in early years. I was born in actually Cedar Level, Virginia, which was my grandparents' house between Petersburg and Hopewell. And uh, uh, my grandfather, it, my grandfather lost the house during the Depression, but I grew up in, in Petersburg and went to Petersburg High School. And what was the early? What was grade school like? Uh, the school that I went to grade school in is still there, and uh, D. M. Brown, and met some lifelong friends that in grade school that I still go back and visit with from time to time. And uh, uh, we had a junior high school, also Bowling Junior High School, and everybody walked to school or, or rode city buses to school. There weren't any school buses like now, and I always walked to school to, to each of the schools. And uh, uh, really enjoyed Petersburg High School. In fact, there's an organization now called POGO. It's the Petersburg Old Geezers Organization. And they meet uh, quarterly, I guess it is, and I go over to those meetings whenever I don't have a conflict. Sure. So it's how a, large was your class, and what were there student clubs that you belonged to, or uh, uh, I think we had a couple of hundred in the graduating class, and we had high Y clubs. The girls had sororities, and I don't remember what any of them were called, but uh, uh, we had two high Y clubs, and I was. I remember one of the, the high, high wire clubs in, in high school. Mm -hmm. and uh, were they, were, Did you participate in any athletics at all when you were there? I played a little bit of football, not okay. a lot. Okay. And uh, I, uh, I ran track several years. That was probably the sport that I... That seems to be, most, in people in that area, track and field seems to be pretty big. A lot of people would participate in that, yeah. more so than some of the others. It was a little larger group, perhaps. And, and my high school was unusual. I didn't realize it at the time, but, but our football team played college junior varsity football teams. We played Randolph-Macon, JVs, and Hampton-Sydney JVs, and played Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And, and I mean, I thought all schools did that kind of thing, and I didn't realize until years later that that was sort of an unusual I think in years situation. past at Purdue, this was true, that you had to be a sophomore before you could play, but they used to have varsity to freshman things, yeah, but that, that yeah. changed over time, Year, years yeah, back, that, many football. schools, yeah. I, I would hate to think playing against the Purdue freshman team. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of a challenge. Or junior varsity, right. <laughs> right. Then came college, where did... Um, well, I went in the Air Force. Oh, uh, after you got out of Yeah, high after I finished high school, uh, uh, the Korean War started, and I went uh, in the Air Force and spent four years in, in the Air Force primarily. Where were you stationed? Uh, well, I went through radar school and uh, ended up at a radar site in Michigan. And then... Uh, they had what was called the Ground Observer Corps during the Korean War, and there was a actually there's a post out here uh, north of town that I think is still out there. They advertised it was in dilapidated shape. I think they wanted to restore it, but I had 43 of those posts that I had to, had to visit and organize and train. And then we had a filter center in Lexington. And the filter center that these posts reported into was South Bend, but the ones around in eastern Kentucky reported to the one in Lexington, so we worked out of out of Lexington. Were there military people that that took care of them, or were there volunteers? They, the, uh, there were civilian volunteers in the filter center and also at the observation posts. Okay. Uh, though we did have military people, uh, the volunteers would man, there was a big table, a big map, and they push little plastic things around on the table to represent airplanes. But up on the dais, we had military people, and they would be calling the information into a radar site. So this was more or less to supplement the, the radar, because the radar could pick up the airplanes at high altitude, and this was to get the lower airplanes. The lower ones, yeah. yeah. Okay. And then after uh, you finished your service, then what, what came next? I uh, ended up in school at Auburn, and that's where I met Rhoda. Oh, so you went to college then? Yeah, went, uh, 
when I first got there, probably within the first couple of weeks. She was a senior, and uh, uh, she was about ready to graduate and had a, had a year to go, and I had four years to go at that point. Did you, were, could you take advantage of the GI Bill? Yes. Were you eligible for yeah. that? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Then uh, what was your major, and did you end up getting married while you were there? Uh, no, I didn't get married until after we graduated. Oh, okay. And uh, uh, I worked, I flight instructed the last few years that I was in school. We, we had an airport. I was in the School of Engineering, but my major was aeronautical administration within, within the School of Engineering. At Auburn University? At Auburn, right. Okay, okay. What was the college like then? Uh, oh, was especially great... when you came back after having been in the service. It was a great place to go to school, and uh, uh, the professor that uh, I probably spent the most time with was uh, had been a Navy pilot during the Korean War, and he was a chief flight instructor and also taught the aeronautical engineering courses. And uh, so it was kind of an unusual situation. The students were pretty much on a first-name basis with him, and he probably was the person that I tried to pattern my teaching mostly after after when I came to Purdue. Sure, okay. What, what came after you graduated then? What was next? Well... Tell us your career path before you came to Purdue. Uh, I, I was trying to get into industry in uh, working in a, a liaison with flight tests because I wanted to be near the, the actual airplanes and uh, uh, but it, and I had some nice interviews, but about that time it was probably not as bad as now, but it, the employment wasn't very good and things kind of went downhill. So I ended up going with what was then called the CAA, Civil Aeronautics Administration. That's what is now the FAA. Okay. And I what worked... Year, what year did you graduate from? Harvard? 58. Okay. okay. And I worked in Atlanta Center uh, for, oh, uh, I guess maybe... A little, a little less than a year, uh -huh. and uh, I didn't really enjoy that work particularly. It, you, you, it was shift work, and some of the things that that I thought I was going to get to do some flying while I was with them, but that didn't pan out. And I requested permission to be able to flight instruct uh, on my own in the Atlanta area, and it took them six months to give me an answer on that. And, then Rhoda found my, my next job. She was looking at the paper and they needed instructors at Spence Air Base in Moultrie, Georgia. And uh, so I went down there as, a, as an academic instructor. And uh, What sort of a facility was that? Uh, it was an Air Force primary pilot training. Okay. And I taught uh, what was called principles of flight, which is sort of uh, aerodynamics for pilots, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, flew the airplanes that they had, and there were three of us that were going to start, uh, we were going to take a class through in academics, and then one of us at a time would rotate out and instruct up on the flight line, which we were looking forward to. Uh, but then we found out the base was going to close, so then we had to start looking for another job. So I was there from January of, of 59 until uh, September of 60 when we came up here. Okay. How did the uh, appointment at Purdue come about? How did you happen to come here? Uh, well, uh, some of us went down on weekends and flight instructed at, at uh, Turner Air Force Base. Uh, they had an aero club and they had T-34s, which were similar to the airplanes that we had at, at Spence. The aero club had two of them. So some of the flight instructors and I went down on weekends to instruct for the Turner Aero Club. And uh, they had a thing called Trade a Plane, which is an aviation publication. People advertise for positions and airplanes for sale and that sort of thing in it. And I was looking at the Trade a Plane and I saw this position up here advertised. And so I, I flew a T-34 up here. That's the, different. <laughs> you know, we all want to do that. In the summer <laughs> of uh, 60 and interviewed with uh, Professor Maris. He was the head of He that. was the department head at that yeah, time. Sure. And uh, in fact, I think his house was one of the first I was in. Uh, I ever went in in Lafayette. And uh, so he, he hired me, and then I came back in September and started 
social work too. Okay. Uh, where did you live when you, and you, of course, you were married by that time, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Whereabouts did you live when you first came here? We lived on David Ross Road, okay. which, are you familiar with where that is right. or was? Sure. Yeah. And the old houses that used to be up there? That's right. In fact, just how many weekends ago, about two weekends ago, we, uh, we still meet with some of our David Ross Road friends. And we've met in Florida, we've met here in Lafayette, we've met in Madison, Wisconsin, we've met in Milwaukee, we've met in Chicago, and uh, Very nice. so there were, kind of long, what, there were, how many, what, there would have been six, six couples, I guess, I've forgotten now, how many were there, but, uh, but we still get together periodically, because at that time we were all young, with young children, sure. living over there together, you could stay there two years, and that kind of gave you a chance to figure out where you wanted right. to settle. That's right. Well, tell us about initially uh, the programs that you were involved in and the curriculum. The particularly one, of course, would be that professional pilot program. Well, when I came, the department had three programs. Let me ask the, one other thing. Were you still, you're off, the school was at the airport? Yes. Or yeah. the building, mm -hmm. the, which is now under remodeling right, construction? Right. Okay. Uh, we had the uh, professional pilot program and uh, an aircraft maintenance technician program and an aviation electronics technician program. And they were all associate degree programs at that time, two-year programs. Okay. And uh, then they started up a two-year general flight program, which would take people from no flight training to come into the old associate degree program. You had to have a commercial pilot certificate to get in and then you had to be able to get your instrument rating within the first year because the second year you flew with Purdue Airlines which was Jerry Goldman. Jerry was the chief pilot for that and uh, so uh, initially the students came in with a commercial pilot certificate and the uh, Jill McCormick, I don't know whether you've heard, I, I've heard that her name, name. Jill mentioned. was the instructor when I came and she and I, essentially, Jill was the program uh, to begin with. Uh, just she and, and Professor Maris were, I think, the first two people in the department. And uh, Jill developed the flight program. And then they hired uh, a fellow that worked with Jill. And he left and went with Delta Airlines. That was Paul West. And then they hired a replacement for Paul, whose name I can't remember. And... Uh, he he left and I replaced replaced him. Okay. Let me ask you if if they had to have a license to enter the program and when it was a two year, were they an older student or were they been people? Probably been, well, uh, a little older. Okay. In fact, some of them had been in the service. Okay. So and, they weren't uh, uh, right. Um, not many. Would not be a right out of high school. school. Sure. Because they, okay. they had to have for the commercial pilot certificate, you needed about two hundred hours of flight time. Right. So uh, generally, they were a little, little bit older. And uh, so then I developed, uh, of course this is, this is done as a committee, but I, I guess I'd have to say I was kind of the primary developer. This went through several committees after sure. me of the BS, first BS degree program in the department. Right. And uh, so then we took the, the pro pilot associate degree program, which I had been working with, became the second two years of of the program and the first two of the BS degree program in the first two years were called general flight technology. And so after uh, the way it was when that was first set up, you could have gotten two associate degrees and no BS degree. So when we you go was, one track on one and one track right, on another. Right. Sure. And because you couldn't really go into the second one until you had finished the first sure. one. They had what you needed in the first two years to come into the second program, which initially was an associate degree program. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, general flight had pretty well been established. And so, and uh, just about that time I started working. So by the time the first people finished that program, we had the BS degree program lined up. So the graduates came out of the, pro, out of the general flight program and entered into the second two years for their BS degree. Okay. Though we had, the first graduates were in uh, 68, the first class had finished, but we had one guy who was a pilot and was also on the maintenance program that had had a lot of the coursework. And as I was working on the curriculum, 
he kept coming in and asking me what the courses were going to be, and I, I said, well, you know, there's no guarantee that this will end up this way, but if you want to take these courses, go ahead. You know, we can't guarantee even that the curriculum would be approved at that point. So he started taking the courses, and about the time we got the curriculum approved, he he met all the requirements. So he was, we had one graduate in the first class in 67, and then the first class that finished intact that had been through from start to finish finished in 68. Yeah, yeah. right. What prompted the, uh, what were the thoughts to move it to a four-year program instead of the, was it the uh, market and... Well, or a number the, of factors. Uh, there was a, a market at that time for the graduates. In fact, we had a little bit of a problem uh, when we were flying the, with the DC threes, and that uh, a lot of the airlines were still flying DC threes, and we had graduates that uh, that left early, even in an associate degree program, to go with the airlines. And uh, Chad Copey, who was with Delta, we went up to his his son later came through the program, and we went up to his son's wedding. Uh, Chad left early and went with, with Delta. Mm -hmm. And uh, then the, the next big change, uh, Purdue Airlines had DC-6s, and the DC-6 required a flight engineer. And so uh, and we at about the same time I arrived, we happened to get a DC-6 cockpit procedures trainer that American Airlines gave us. And so I, I wrote a, a flight engineer program for the DC-6, and so then the students could get, uh, not too many of them actually did it, uh, but uh, we g gave all of the academic training and the students could take the flight engineer written, which was helpful in getting an airline job. And uh, so that became an integral part of the BS degree program. And, and we had a few students that actually went in and got their, their flight engineer certificate into DC-6, mm -hmm. but it wasn't like later when we had the program with the 707, DC-8, and 727, when virtually all of the students got their flight engineer certificate. Okay. What, I, was, the, what was the job market for the graduates? Pretty good? Pretty good, yeah, at that time. And you had male and female? Not initially. Okay. Uh, our first girl finished in 71, I believe it was. I'd have to check, but I'm, that's within a year anyway. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, I don't know whether we ought to put this next thing in here. Or turn turn that off yeah, for a sure. second. Yeah, it might be <laughs> well, a well, good time to at least interject that air, the time with the Purdue Aeronautics and the, okay. program, and the course. Uh, so she, uh, well, actually, we did have the BS degree program by the time she finished. Uh, uh, well, the, by the time the first girl finished, we did not take that one. Sure. Uh, but then, then as the airline was spooling down, uh, we t took the first girl into the program. And she came in, it would have been about 69 or so, and, uh, and was just here two years. And uh, uh, she finished, and she was one of the first eight female Navy pilots after she left here. She went and joined the Navy then? She joined the Navy, and she married one of her classmates who was also, a, he had been in Naval ROTC, she had not been in ROTC. So he was ahead of her in Navy flight training, but she became the first female Navy pilot to fly fighter or attack type airplanes. And she became uh, the first female Navy pilot to command a flying squadron. And she retired from the Navy as a captain. And she was a weapon systems test pilot on the A-7. So she, she really, really blazed a trail. In a, she in sure a, did, like Amelia. A, right, and a funny thing, that happened uh, uh, years later, there was another Purdue girl, Lucy Young, who played basketball at Purdue, and she had also been a Navy pilot, but years later, and she uh, is a pilot with uh, U.S. Air, and I met her someplace, and so I asked her if she knew Rosemary, and she said, yeah, Rosemary was the grand old lady of naval aviation, <laughs> <laughs> which... Which she, she was younger than most of our students when she was here. So for her to move from that category to being the grand old lady of Navy, <laughs> Naval That's Aviation elite. was quite a step, right? Sure, yeah. What was the time did uh, with Purdue uh, uh, Aeronautics or with the with the program? Did they uh, use the equipment? I well, the, when uh, we taught DC three systems courses 
in the old associate degree program, okay. and then the students actually flew as co-pilots on with the airline. For all of this, all of the co-pilots were Purdue our Air, students Purdue with Purdue Airlines. Okay, okay. And uh, uh, the captains were all professional captains, and then they got DC sixes, and we would check about two students a year out as DC six co-pilots. Some of the sharper students became also DC six co-pilots, and then. Uh, they got jets and they replaced essentially replaced the DC sixes. They had DC threes longer than they had the DC sixes, as I remember. And uh, we checked three students out, sent three students down to Miami with Eastern, and they were actually checked out as DC nine co pilots when we had the jets. Uh, one of them came back and left right away and went with TWA, as I recall, and the other two. Uh, flew with, uh, continued to fly with uh, Purdue Airlines until they graduated as DC-9, which were the, mm -hmm. the jet uh, co-pilot. Sure. And uh, those two ended up with Southwest Airlines, and and one of them is now the num uh, number one guy on the seniority list with Southwest Airlines, and the other one left Southwest because he wasn't sure that was going to last and went with Delta, which... Uh, has had more problems than Southwest. Yeah. And his son later came through our program. Oh. So we've had several second generation sure. students in the That's program. That's kind of nice. Yeah. Well, you sort of were in charge of the academic administration was your primary responsibility for a great course of the time you were there. Yes, the for the department. last two years sure. of, the, of the program. And uh, I taught uh, a lot of the same classes throughout the whole time I was here and also instructed in the, the simulators and uh, flew some of the transportation airplanes. Now, the, the LARS flying that you mentioned, yes. the Laboratory for sure. Application of Remote Sensing, they had some uh, what they call confirm confirmation photography. They were getting satellite imagery, but from the satellites, they couldn't tell uh, what... A crop was at a certain intersection. That at that time the satellite imagery was not that, it's developed that as good. Industry. So they needed to know. Uh, so they would give us a, a place to fly. One time I went to the upper right hand corner of Kansas and flew from there to the southern border, moved over, flew back to the northern border, went across Kansas, and I had a couple of guys from Lars. We had a camera in the airplane and we were taking aerial photography. And from these, they could identify in, co in cooperation with people on the ground, they could identify crops. So then my understanding was that Lars took this information and they knew this field was wheat or oats or corn or barley or whatever. And then they told the computer, when you see something that looks like this, this is what it is. And then the computer would print out, it could look at the satellite imagery and would tell uh, would print out little W for wheat or whatever different identifiers for the various crops. And so that was part yeah, of the stuff that Lars cool. developed. Sure. Uh, how about the department? Uh, we talked a little bit about that, but getting some of your equipment and did you, industry supports, did you get some planes? How, how your equipment? Well, uh, initially, uh, some of the first DC 3s I think came from Eastern. And then they, they got some surplus DC-3s, which Purdue Airlines actually had been military C-47s. That was what the, the Air Force or Air Corps called them. And they converted those to airline-type airplanes, and some of those already had cargo doors on them and were used for cargo or passenger flights. Uh, and so essentially all of that was done pretty much by Purdue Airlines, not by the department, sure. Jerry Goldman and, and Grove Webster and so forth. Uh, then the DC-6s, the first uh, DC-6s were the educational TV and Patty Midwest program for airborne television instruction. And the big... Uh, that was a... Um, put, put Purdue on the news. I mean, it was just yeah. very unique. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I remember hearing about him before I came, and I Dave filled me in a little bit on that. I mean, I think it's an interesting program. It was. Um, there's not many people around... That remember that program. If you go in the hangar, hangar six at the airport, there's a big picture of one of the airplanes up on the wall, and you can see the antenna. Oh, really? Uh, down oh, below. Okay, it. okay. And the, the, how it benefited uh, my part of the program 
those airplanes were DC-6s, and it was because of that that I wrote the DC-6 Flight Engineer Program. And our students could go ride on those trips and get flight engineer time uh, on the airplane because they took off early in the morning and stayed up until mid-afternoon. So they could almost get enough time in one flight to qualify for a fl sure. had to have five hours of airplane time. Sure. So they virtually qualified, and they had a captive flight engineer. That, there was also a, a flight engineer on the airplane that could teach them while they were flying, and sure. we had that trainer, and then later we had a DC-6 simulator, which... Uh, which we could do the flight engineer training in, so that all fit together very well. Yeah. When we got the DC-9s, uh, I went out to California to school, went through Douglas's school on the DC-9 and came back. Couple, uh, uh, we had a couple of people that, that went out and did that, and so we taught DC-9 systems then to the students. But as I said, that was a very expensive thing to try to check students out, so there were only three students that were ever checked out completely as DC-9 co-pilots, though they got, all of the students got to ride along as observers on sure. on flights, so they, and when we didn't have passengers, they'd get to fly the airplane, but it wasn't a full co-pilot check out right, in yeah. the airplane. What about the university plane? Did you fly that as well? The, Purdue, the university plane that Purdue? Uh, yeah, we had uh, initially, we had well, uh, we used to fly Hovde around in a in a Cessna 172 light airplane, a single engine light airplane, and but uh, for longer trips they would take them in a DC-3, and they also flew some of the athletic teams but that in, was a in the DC-3s. Yes, okay. but then when the airline folded, uh, we had uh, a, an X C-45, which was an Air Force twin engine airplane and the civilian equivalent of that is called a Twin Beach or Beach 18. And we had two of those, and when we no longer had the airline to fly uh, of the, in, the, in the later presence around, and we flew them in the Twin Beaches, and the students flew co-pilot in those airplanes. But, the, but with those airplanes, there wasn't nearly as much flight time available for the students as there was when they were operating a bunch of DC-3s and 6s and 9s. Uh, but still it was good experience for them, though it was a lot more limited. Then we replaced the Twin Beach with a Piper Navajo, which was a uh, plane that was a little more economical to operate than the Twin Beaches and uh, wasn't quite as challenging to fly for the students as the, yeah, as the Twin yeah. Beaches. And then in 83 was a particularly big year for us. Uh, we we had, we had wanted to get a turboprop airplane, and uh, so we had been through the mill several times to get a turboprop, a King Air, which would be pressurized and a more up-to-date airplane than the airplanes that, that we had been flying the President in. And uh, uh, that was when Dr. Hansen left, and he wanted to get the airplane, but I think he was a little afraid how it would look in Indianapolis Star when Purdue went out and bought a, a million dollar airplane for yeah, these few students yeah. to fly. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, he wanted to do it, but he was afraid it would reflect negatively on the university. So though though his, his it was a personal conflict with him because... Didn't he do a little flying? Yes, yeah. I've read that. And uh, in fact, he, he got... Uh, did went up through his instrument rating in the department and flew. I thought so I he, he was really interested in it, but he just didn't want to do anything that could possibly reflect on the university. So then when John Hicks was the interim president, we got the word that we were uh, getting a, a King Air, finally, which we had wanted for a long time. And, uh, and we knew that he wouldn't have done that on his own, that a Dr. Bering, who was the next fellow coming in, that that he had to have approved that. And he had been an Air Force flight surgeon, so he had a, an interest in, in sure. aviation. Right. And uh, so, so we got our first King Air at that point, and we also got the, the simulator with their... our. We had had the DC-6 simulator, then we had a 707 simulator, which we got kind of through, uh, well, American Airlines was going to give it to us, and they realized it wasn't theirs, that they were leasing it from Curtis Wright. And so 
uh, we went to Curtis Wright and they ended up donating it to us. So then we had a jet simulator. That was our first jet simulator for uh, airlines. And uh, so uh, Bill Turner, who was one of the instru instructors at that point, he had been a Navy navigator. Bill then wrote, he wrote the flight engineer program for the 707. And we used that simulator for a, a number of years. We really needed a 727 because that was what most of our students were going. When they went with the airlines, that was what they ended up being was a 727 flight engineer initially. So they started phasing the 707s out. And so we weren't going to have any place uh, to send them to take their 707 check ride. At that point, you had to do it in the airplane and we had been sending them to American Airlines after we finished. So <clears throat> uh, American phased its 707s out, and we were really concerned about uh, we were going to have to drop the engineer program because at that time it had to be taken in an airplane. It couldn't be taken in a simulator. So then one of our students came back from a, spring, from a Thanksgiving break, and he said United is phasing their DC-8 simulators out. Well, the DC-8s were still operating with the airlines. So... Uh, we got in touch with United and we got the DC-8 simulator. And I think by that time uh, Dick Ortman was here and I think Dick rewrote the engineer program for the DC-8. And uh, so we, but we were still shooting toward the 727. That was what we really wanted. And in, in 83, uh, American Airlines sold us a 727 simulator. And as I recall, I think we paid uh, $45,000 or something like that for it, which was a real bargain basement price for a simulator. I'm sure. uh, now one would cost you in the millions of dollars. <laughs> and so uh, Bill Turner, no, Dick Ortman did the, uh, the flight engineer program for the 727. And we got that in 83. We got the first King Air in 83. So 83 was a particularly big year for us. Sure. And at that point, we were pretty much exactly where we wanted to be with all of our training devices. We had turboprop, King Air, and uh, and I taught the systems course for the King Air and uh, Dick Ortman and uh, Don James and several other people taught the systems yeah. courses for the 727. What and, about uh, the astronauts? Well. We didn't really have, uh, I think maybe some of them, when they had the ROTC flight indoctrination program, which was before I came, oh, okay. uh, I had instructed in the one at Auburn, but by the time I came here, I think that was either phased out or pretty much, and some of the astronauts did go through that, and I'm not sure which ones. Okay. So... Uh, 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 Professor Maris had some of the log books for some of those people that that did go through some of the later astronauts, and but we had one student who is not carried as one of Purdue's astronauts, and he finished our program, uh, and I'd have to check on the date, but I would, I'm almost afraid in the 70s anyway. Sure. Okay. And after he'd been out, he asked if I. Uh, he was a really sharp student. And his wife had been a uh, dietitian at one of the hospitals, and he had worked at the hospital kind of as an uh, orderly or something while he was in college. So I knew he had an interest in it. And I, uh, he contacted me and asked if I would write him a letter of recommendation for the University of Wisconsin Medical School. And really sharp guy, and I knew he'd had some, a long time interest in, in medicine. And they accepted him. and and I would hear from him periodically, and I knew when he graduated. And so, uh, and at that time, I don't think he uh, thought he would ever pass the airline physical, but the airlines through the years have downgraded their vision requirements. You, there is a minimum for FAA requirement, but the airlines, and they all exceeded that, but the airlines had their vision requirements that were way in above the FAA requirements, some of them like the military requirement, 2020 uncorrected, you couldn't wear glasses. Well, he couldn't satisfy that, so I think he, at that point, he didn't think he would get on with the airlines. <clears throat> so, and he flew a, an airplane for a swimming pool company in Fort Wayne, so I'd be in Fort Wayne and I would 
uh, call him up and if, if I had a trip up there, we'd get together for lunch or something. This was before I, I heard from him for the letter of recommendation. Sure. Well, after I did that and he had finished medical school, I was at it United at a meeting and going through a cafeteria a buffet luncheon line and somebody grabbed him by the arm and I turned around and it was Bill Hammond. And Bill uh, was in with United and I said, well, what about your MD? And he said, well, I work, I work with United's medical department and he was also an aviation medical consultant to NASA. And later he was trying to get on a shuttle flight and later he was assigned to a shuttle flight. And then uh, he was working with the girl that was killed in uh, oh, 107. Uh, that was a flight, he was, a flight he was assigned to. In fact, I, I partly retired early because the shuttle flight he was going to go on was going to be early in 2001. And uh, we, one of our daughters lived in, in Orlando at that time. And I think Bill Duncan had gone down for a couple of shuttle launches and they'd been delayed. He'd come back and go down again and delayed. And I think it finally went, he didn't see it. So I figured, well, I would like to go down when Bill Hammond goes on STS-107. <clears throat> and so I just went ahead and retired in December, but then they were equipping the space station and so they put the scientific shuttle flights off. So it was delayed several different times. And finally, uh, uh, he was pulled off of the flight because they put a, a astronaut on from a different co country. This was a, a political thing, and, but he continued to work on the ground with the. Pro they were working with uh, changes in bone density under weightless conditions, and he was getting data from the female doctor who he had known in medical school. Uh, she was sending data back to him, and then that's the one that uh, that. Uh, burned up on the re-entry yeah. yeah so he's still with united and he said he's probably getting too old now to expect to go to be on a shuttle <laughs> well, flight but he he had actually been through all the training and was sure. was originally to go on that but he's never listed as one of Purdue's astronauts because he he didn't take a specific he never went on a flight right yeah um a couple of things we talked the um were you a, a fat fellow um not with any of the, the no, office. I was okay. uh, uh, advisor to uh, the faculty advisor for the PACAs here at, okay. at one point. Okay. Yeah. All right. And there's the uh, the Holman Niswanger Assimilator Center? Uh, okay. Yes, Scott Niswanger is uh, one of our graduates and uh, Scott went through in the old associate degree program mm -hmm. and he ended up getting his BS degree from a sc school in Tennessee. And, uh, uh, and and this was purely an accidental type thing. He was here visiting one time, and our new big 707, uh, 727 level C simulator, which is the most exotic simulator that we have, the, the, the first one that I mentioned, the first 727 we got was a level A, and it has a three-axis motion system. It has pitch, roll, and heave. And the, the C model sits way up on, and it has six axis of freedom and really moves around. The cockpit, you could hardly tell the difference between the two if you were in the cockpit, but, uh, but the external appearance is significant. Mm -hmm. And uh, we didn't have a building big enough to put that in. Our old simulator facility was a pole barn on the east, end of, east side of the aviation technology building. And so we, when we got this simulator from NASA, and incidentally, Neil Armstrong was uh, very helpful in getting that simulator from NASA. The FAA wanted it, and for some reason, Neil Armstrong carried more weight than the FAA did, and we got it here. And, uh, but anyway, we had put it in Hangar 4, which is the big hangar with all the external girders on top of it. That hangar was built for the DC-6s, initially the educational TV airplanes. And, but the problem we had was that we couldn't heat that hangar in the winter and we couldn't cool it in the summer. And it was dusty and it was a real problem. And Scott, we were just walking around and I was showing him facilities and, and, uh, and Wes Carter, our simulator tech, chief simulator technician at that time, had said, 
that he didn't think they were going to really be able to maintain it much longer in that in that facility because of dust and so sure. forth. And so, you know, I just was speaking honestly with Scott, just as I would have with any of our students walking around with him. So then uh, he, he ended up uh, buying us uh, that simulator building or contributing about a million dollars for to that to that building. Well, I worked out. I mean, it wasn't that it, it wasn't that I was pleading him for. You know, I, we just took a look. I, I wasn't asking him for money. I'm just stating the facts. Sometimes things a little just casually, you know, you never know where yeah. you're going to take so it. So that, that, that came as a surprise, a, a very pleasant surprise. Yeah, and of course he's, he gave money for the new uh, addition. New Ant Tech building, right. right. Yeah. Yeah. Nice longer building. Yeah, now. that's yeah. right. It should be nice. Um, let's see, you're listed in the, you remember, you were the chapter president state secretary of Air Force Association. You still stayed active in that? Uh, I'm still a member. Okay. Uh, we don't even have a local chapter okay. anymore. Uh, I'm still a member. I get their magazine and so okay. forth. Well, that's good. And then also you were listed in Who's Who in the Midwest. And uh, I asked, want to ask you about the Charles F. Holman Undergraduate Scholarship. Uh, in about 97, I believe it was, uh, we had a uh, reunion. And the, the building uh, had, let's see, it was the... Uh, I'm trying to remember. I, th I think it was, it was an anniversary, roughly an anniversary of of the first. I think maybe the first graduates were in '57, and so '97 would have been 40 years. Uh, the first graduates were, of course, before I came in '60. Sure. sure. But uh, so we picked '97 to have sort of a reunion. And that building at that time had been, here I'm trying to remember, uh, uh, well anyway, I'll, I'll back up to the reunion part of it. Yeah. And so we had a lot of students back for that. And I don't know who initiated it, but the students, oh, and they, also I had gone on a 10-month appointment. And I think Pam Ritter had told them I was retiring or something. So part of, of uh, so th th this was, th this sort of ended up being a retirement party for me, which was a surprise because I hadn't retired yet. But I think, the, I, I think the letter that went out implied that somehow. And, uh. But uh, so in connection with that, that scholarship was was put together, and I Scott was a heavy uh, uh, investor in that too, plus a lot of other sure. students. Yeah, and so that's how that that got started. Well, that's very nice. Yeah, um, you've had some department when you came, Jim Maris, and I, um, and then. Dun Professor Duncan, yeah, and then who, uh, Mike Cruz oh, after, Mike that. Right. after that, yeah, okay, okay. So they all each one brings a little bit difference. Yeah, to them. Uh, Jim Maris was unusual. Jim had been a B twenty four pilot in World War Two, and uh, he begged, borrowed, and I'm not sure, maybe even, <laughs> well, I, I don't think he would have stolen anything. Maybe some of the other people might have, but, but the, 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 the department was put together with rubber bands and paper clips and, <laughs> and you know, to begin with. And, and he was the prime mover in that. And, uh, uh, it, he, he was the one that got it started and got it on its, on its legs and, sure. and, Pulled in a lot of, we got some airplane donations, the Twin Beach that I mentioned uh, that we flew the president around in, the E-18S. And uh, so it was it was really scraping pretty thin sometime. Uh, I, I, think, so I, I don't know true. whether you've ever met Erwin Trigger. Erwin was the jet engines instructor. Okay. Well, I think they have a jet test cell and I think uh, uh, they had gotten donations for a lot of this and had bits and pieces that came from different places and they had an engine and they're running. And I think they spent $90 for a fuel flow 
indicator, which was the only thing I think the only major thing that they paid for that was in that test cell. And the test cell has a different engine in it now, and the test cell's been modified several times, but I think that same fuel flow indicator is still in there. Still being used, right? right. And yeah. uh, uh, Irwin would be a good person to talk about the jet engines part okay. of it, because okay. he was the prime jet engines instructor, wrote the textbook that they used for years in it, and has been all over the world teaching. Uh, went to South Africa several times to teach uh, the accident investigators in the South African Air Force about jet engines and so right. forth. Okay, good. Uh, do you still keep active in uh, what the Experimental Aircraft Association? Yes. Yeah. Is that the similar one that runs that uh, air show up in Wisconsin? Oshkosh? Oshkosh. 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 Right. right. Yeah. And uh, that's still so close on. Right. Right. I go up there almost every almost every year. And then there's another facet to the uh, EAA has several little subdivisions, and one is the uh, International Aerobatic Club and uh, uh, Warbirds and Antique Airplanes. There are several different subdivisions. And uh, I'm a member of a Warbird Squadron in Indianapolis. These are people, enthusiasts, old World War II sure. airplanes and so forth. And uh, so I go up, usually uh, a group of us go up every year, a couple of weeks before Oshkosh to do paint up, fix up work in the Walberg area up there, uh -huh. in addition to going up for the sure. air show. Yeah. yeah. What about uh, Purdue tradition? Do you have a favorite Purdue tradition? And I'm going to ask you an outstanding event, if you can answer both or whichever. Purdue uh, traditions. traditions. Well, I, I used to think the cords were a pretty neat tradition, but that's... Uh, <laughs> That, Some still wear them to the game. Yeah, but you don't see that no. much anymore. Oh, no. Most of the students We got a probably. couple donations. We got a skirt and we got a, uh, the archives got a pair of pants too, you know. And yeah. I had a student that worked for me and she made her own. And you know the little Purdue engine? Well, that's in her rear, so when she walks, the engine moves. Oh, and is that engine, right? <laughs> it's great. She just wore it all the time. <laughs> okay. uh, how about an outstanding event? Any comes to mind? Well, of course, football and all of the athletic sure. and basketball type stuff. Right. I don't guess they have the nude Olympics anymore over there. Yes. That was a. <laughs> I'm not sure when that disappeared. I, that was some years back. Yeah, some years back. That cold February days. <laughs> uh, you know, things that are unique to Purdue, kind of the chords and that, and of course every. Major college has football and basketball and right. basket and so forth. But uh, the things that were kind of unique to Purdue, uh, th those those were unique. And then the uh, the Grand Prix, right. and I, I I'm not sure how that worked out this year with the move. Did was it as successful as it has been? They said they had a good turnout. Yeah. Uh, I sort of missed. It being so close. It yeah, it was very convenient. You could just walk oh. across the street to I it. didn't go, but I listened to the practice, but it said they had a good turnout. The problem, they ran shuttle buses, I yeah. understand, because there's no there wasn't to any park. place to park there out, no there. Yeah. out there. So I, I saw that as being a problem, but I didn't know how... I mean, people that would have just kind of casually walked up to it before, they might have lost some of those. I imagine, that's right. Yeah. What about them? Did you have been, uh, your children? Did any of them go to Purdue? Both. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we have two, two daughters and... Uh, the older one, uh, it was kind of funny, we, we had graduates that came back from time to time with their wives or girlfriends who were flight attendants, and our oldest daughter, real early, uh, she asked one of uh, the girls if you had to have a degree to be a flight attendant, and she said, well, she thought you'd, maybe two years would help, and uh, so I think Sonia's first response was she'd go to school for two years and quit and then be a flight attendant. So that was the first indication, I think, of her interest in it. Well, she she, she went all four years and finished, but she did become a flight attendant, she? and she still is she, one. What airline did she fly for? Well, she's been, she started with Capital, which was uh -huh. n not the Capital that merged with United, but another Capital. And uh, uh, then they went under and, and once she was furloughed from there, and she flew with an, an outfit out of Florida that flew the Hodge, which was a, a revelation. Uh, they flew, went all over Africa and picked up uh, Muslims and took them to 
to Jeddah, and then they were bused to to uh, Mecca. to Mecca, and then they had a couple of weeks off while that was going on, and they went all over Europe, and then came back and took them back home. Them so up. that was an education in itself. And uh, then she ended up with ATA in Indianapolis, and uh, flew with them for years and years, and then they went belly up, and she's now with. Uh, uh, Open Skies, which is a subsidiary of British Airways, and she flies uh, out of uh, Kennedy Airport to uh, Paris and Amsterdam. Oh, okay. And our, our younger daughter, uh, uh, was about to finish school, and she uh, had a potential job in Indianapolis if the outfit got a contract. And, so she wasn't going to know until in the fall, and so uh, ATA was hiring part-time flight attendants at that point, So, and Caroline had never indicated any interest. I'd never heard her say anything about being a flight attendant, whereas Sonia had always. So Sonia said, well, why don't you come and work with ATA for the summer? And so Caroline applied and was accepted, and Sonia taught the new higher ground school class that Caroline went through. <laughs> and... Uh, and after she finished, they went on a trip, and I think they went to Rome and Paris and Athens, you know, all on one trip, which was a great trip for the two of them. Oh, sure. And uh, then Caroline flew with them up until the time. Uh, no. Well, she was, well, she, she, she got a job. She was assistant production manager for the Saturday Evening Post, and she could, this was a kind of a part-time thing, the flying was. So she did that, and then she went with a, advertising agency and she continued to fly uh, as a flight attendant until she got married in the meantime and when her first baby was uh, due she didn't know what the rule ATA didn't have any rules for how long you could work and so I called one of our graduates whose wife was a very senior flight attendant with Delta and and said to ask her what Delta's rule was, so that became ATA's rule as far as Caroline was concerned. And, but she never went back okay. uh, after after the first sure. child. Okay. But uh, she she did it for a period of time, yeah. She was able to enjoy it while she was enjoying yeah, that's yeah, right. But both of them finished school at Purdue, yeah. yeah. Uh, in closing, any final comments that you'd like to share with us as you look back or ahead? <laughs> what are you doing in retirement? Your retirement. Yeah, that would be a good one. Um, mow the yard. <laughs> okay. And keep active in some of your associations. So. Yeah. He gets called on to do a lot of speeches. Oh, yes. I right. did a program on aviation history for Walla. Good. And I did one for the Indianapolis Aero Club on Purdue simulators a while back. And Good yeah, resource. Yeah, yeah. You've done two for them. Yeah, I've done a couple of programs. Well, one of them was a kind of spur of the moment thing to substitute for a guy that that couldn't make it. Uh -huh. And then the other one was a few weeks ago. And uh, then I've gone down to another outfit down in Nashville and have spoken at Nashville, Indiana, the, the Bald Eagles, and have given them a program. But uh, the thing that I'm working with now uh, is uh, Swift Fuels, who are developing... Uh, uh, fuel for the replacement of aviation gasoline. And oh, years ago, the EPA said you couldn't have any more lead in auto fuels. Well, uh, they had to have it in airplane fuel. Some of the higher performance engines, they couldn't do without it. But initially, they told them they had to have it out of aviation engines in 2008. Well, since they didn't have any replacement, they extended that to 2010. And uh, uh, so a fellow, uh, John Russick, who has a, an appointment in aeronautical engineering, but his degree is in chemistry. John, through one of the recent Avtech graduates, he was talking to the ProPilot graduate and asking what aviation needed. This has been several years ago, and they came up, and John has developed a fuel. And I flew it for the first time that it was flown in an airplane. It had been run in airplane engines on the ground. And uh, so I flew it in probably September of last year, the first time it was actually flown in an airplane, in, in an airplane that I have, an experimental airplane. And uh, so I have, uh, uh, also they they have a, a Navajo, which was like the airplane that we had before we got the first King Air. 
that they have been donated to use as a corporate airplane and I've flown with their people until they got a little experience in the sure. airplane and they've actually flown a trip, one trip with them, so one of the guys could be off. And so, you know, things like that from good. time to time. That's yeah. good. I want to thank you very much for the interview. And also, his wife was sitting in and was a good listener, and we enjoy it. Thank you very much. Well, enjoy <laughs> Thank it. you.